locate in your Bibles this morning the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And this morning, I'm asking you to turn there for the last time in a while because we're concluding after beginning in September of 2018 our series of messages from this great book. When we began, we entitled sort of the the series of messages uh, from this letter, Unhealthy Church. Most of the time, if you're going to be talking about church, you want to be talking about a healthy church. If you're going to be um, entitling a sermon or a series of sermons, or uh, in this case, a a series that spans a couple of years, you you, you want the title to be Healthy Church. Unhealthy Church is not attractive. Uh, Churches are always trying, um, we can be honest, to sort of one-up each other. It's not very healthy. You go on to websites and you, you'll have some that are very transparent in this task. Uh, they may use buzzwords about being a healthy church or a biblical church or a true church or a uh, God honoring church or, a, you know, a confessional church or a, you know, they always have little adjective descriptors that they put um, in front of church, none of them are negative. They want to communicate to you that they're not the cruddy church that you used to go to, right? They, 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 they want you to, to feel like, oh, um, uh, we're, we're, we're different from that place down the road that calls themselves a church, but they're not really. And in fairness, as we've discussed, as we've gone through this letter, there are places that I think it's fair to say have existed in a state of disorderliness for so long, a state of division and immorality and indiscipline for so long that it is quite possible to describe some gatherings of professed Christ followers in terms other than church. But sometimes the healthiest thing for a church to learn how to be healthy, for a church to learn how to be different, for a church to learn how to be more like Christ, is, is not to talk about a healthy church, but to talk about an unhealthy church. And in talking about an unhealthy church, to see ourselves in that church, To see ourselves in our division. To see ourselves in our indiscipline. To see ourselves, so tragically, in our immorality and disorderliness. To see something of ourselves in the unhealthy. To know that apart from God's grace to us in Jesus Christ... That is exactly what we are. And apart from the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, through the preaching of the word, at work in repentant hearers and doers of the word, we would forever be an unhealthy church. Now Paul has caught this unhealthy church in the infancy of its sickness. And he's able to administer, hopefully, through this letter, treatment that will, if it is listened to and if it is responded to, will change the church from the inside out. It will change the very culture of the church. The way they think, the way they speak, the way they act, the way they comport themselves as individuals, 
and the way they congregate themselves as a corporate body of Christ followers. So I want us to approach this last message from 1 Corinthians not with any vain pretensions or false notions that we are where we ought to be. I don't want us to think that individually we have attained a status of spiritual maturity that is in any way acceptable in the eyes of God eternally. I don't want us to think that we as a church, despite the wonderfully nice things that we've, we've heard said about us this morning by our sister uh, Barbara and sister Connie, that we, we are where we need to be. That we are quite as we ought to be. Let us not be satisfied. Let us not be complacent. Let us not be apathetic with where we are now. But let us always be striving for what we ought to be in Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit and according to His grace. Let's read God's Word and let's seek to learn from it. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, Write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning... I want to think in terms of the work of love. It's not the first time that we have seen something about love in 1 Corinthians. But at the conclusion of this letter, the Apostle Paul reminds them once more. Love is the thread that holds together a church that would be healthy. Love is the foundation upon which a healthy church might be built. Love is the spirit, the attitude in which those who would be healthy as a church must relate to one another. Throughout the story of this church, as we read it in this letter at least, there are many ways in which they have fallen short of love. They are divided, not loving. They are suing one another, not loving one another. They are lusting after people, not loving them. They are refraining from biblical discipline, out of some false pretensions and thoughts that maybe that's loving, but in so doing, they are actually hating their brother and their sister because they are not, are, are, are not leading them in the paths of righteousness. They're not saving them by snatching them out of the fire. They are seeking to meet their own needs, to, feel, to, to, to fill their own empty stomachs, to feel and act upon their own sinful desires 
And sometimes their desires might not be sinful intrinsically, but their obsessive pursuit of their own interest at the expense of other people means that they are a church that has fallen out of love both with their Lord and Savior and with one another. But here at the conclusion of the letter, we see some definition of of love uh, as devotion, love in the sense of devotion, devotion that will, will, will cross borders, that will travel far, that will show uh, generous, radical hospitality, that love that will be such as to actually deserve honor and recognition. This sort of love is, is so often lacking. Our love is, is, is complacent. Our love is mild. It's tame. It's, it's uh, milk toast. It's indecisive. It's just not really love that is ablaze for God and for his people. And yet that's what we see modeled in this, this text. We've already defined love based on what we read in uh, the earlier chapter there, the famous chapter uh, 13. But just to remind you and to connect it with this section in brief, love is complete devotion to someone or something as though the object of affection, the noblest, highest affection, the noblest of friendships, as though the object of that is worthy of utmost sacrifice, as though it were something infinitely valuable and precious. That's love. Devoting yourself to someone or something with the noblest, highest form of affection and friendship, as though the object of your love were worthy of highest sacrifice because it is of infinite value and, and precious to you. And that's the kind of love that we see urged throughout this letter. The apostle says, let all that you do be done in love. If all that we do is to be done in love, to whom are we to direct that love? We see it in the text. First of all, love, devotion. Devotion to God's saints. Devotion to the Lord's saints. There's a a few different characters that appear in this text. Sometimes we're minded to just quickly get through these closing words of a letter as though they have no lessons for us or no meaning. If we stopped and we thought about these people and we realized that they're people just like you and me and that what he says about them actually teaches us how to be Christians like them. We might linger a bit longer. There's the household of Siphonus. You see it there in verse 15. I urge you, brothers, he says, you know that the household of Siphonus were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. If you want to know how to love, how to let all that you do be done in love, Look to Christians who give their lives in devotion to the Lord's saints. Who are the saints? I was reading late last night a book that I'm uh, working through with a group of other pastors from across London. And it, it, it's sort of a history showing how Christianity has uh, impacted and influenced and really made um, the, the modern mind, so far as our own society is concerned, at least. Uh, in so doing, it, it lays a foundation of history, and it talks about how at some point, 
people shifted from seeing saints as the living and they started seeing saints as the dead. And at some point it shifted even from that, from saints who are dead, those who believed in Jesus and who've gone to be with Jesus. And it moves to people who were believers in Jesus, who had died, who before death or after death had worked miracles, had done signs, had appeared to people in visions. And suddenly you see even Jesus being supplanted by these saints. So no longer is it, is, is it God's word, it's the, the saints who are speaking to you. No longer is it Jesus who is appearing to, to someone by night, but, 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 but it's the saints. So the Apostle Paul talks about Jesus coming to him at night when he was in Corinth and thinking about giving up. And we see a moments like that throughout Scripture, but suddenly people are talking about the saints. And then it becomes a, a matter of we're going to commemorate the saints. We're going to venerate the saints. So we're going to, to paint pictures of how we imagine them to be. Um, or we're going to carve statues of them. And suddenly the, the, um, the uh, gatherings were characterized by all sorts of religious clutter instead of directing prayers to God through Christ. They directed prayers to the saints who would direct their prayers to Christ, who would direct his prayers to the Father. And so you, 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 you have this system of intermediaries created and this elite group of Christians who are dead and who do great things who are different from you and me. And people begin to think of the saints as people from some other level of spirituality, some higher spiritual plane. And the apostle is not talking about that kind of saint. He's not talking about someone who is approved by a, a, a gathering of uh, spiritual leaders, someone who's died and great things can be said about them. He's, he's not talking about uh, the, the cardinal and the, 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 the pope and the whole institution of the papacy having to give approval to this person for them to be acknowledged as a saint. You have acknowledgement and approval enough in Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are a saint. So act like one. If you, if you are in Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. It's not to say that, that these people are less than you now. They can't be blamed for being venerated. They can't be blamed for other people making them idols. They might have very well been faithful followers of Jesus Christ. You should not seek to live less than they lived. You should seek to follow in their footsteps because they followed Jesus. Somewhere along the way, people lost that the saints were following someone greater than them. So these are not spiritual elites being doted upon by the household of Stephanus. These are everyday Christians. These are people like you and me. And who is Stephanus? He's an everyday Christian like you and me. He's someone who we know very little about other than that the Apostle Paul remembers him almost as an afterthought as someone who was in the church at Corinth that he baptized. That's there in chapter 1 when he's talking about the divisions that are in the church. And he says... Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Some people say that because... Um, he seems to have forgotten Stephanus, that perhaps he baptized Stephanus 
somewhere else. That, that, that a baptized Stephanus, perhaps some have argued in uh, Athens. There's one uh, tradition that's quite old that says that Stephanus may have been in Philippi. But where, whatever and wherever, this is just an everyday Christian, someone that when Paul's writing about members at Corinth whom he baptized, he momentarily forgot. And that's actually with Stephanus possibly in the room or at least in town because we later read, verse 17, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have made up for your absence. In other words, Stephanus has gone to visit the Apostle Paul where he is in Ephesus along with two other people, Fortunatus and Achaicus. They have been refreshing to Paul. Stephanus has continued to devote himself to the service of the saints, including in this case the Apostle Paul, refreshing him with two other people. Uh, the, the, the journey would not have been easy. You, you think, oh, you know, a visit from someone else. Well, 900 miles is substantial even in our time, but imagine 900 miles in those days before automobile transport or flight. It was a 900-mile walk from Corinth to Ephesus. There were routes by sea. Those routes would have taken two weeks. This was no small journey that Stephanus and these two other men went on. And the question I I ask you, I mean, you know, you, you might not cross London on the tube. An hour's journey to minister to a brother or sister. But here's someone who's crossing borders, fields, mountains, valleys, rivers, seas, simply to be a refreshment to the Apostle Paul. In all probability, These men, these three men, were those who carried the letter from Chloe's people, identified there in the first part of the letter, who uh, was reporting on the problems in the church. And they so love the Apostle Paul that they're going to refresh him. And they so love their church that they're going out on behalf of their church to get help because they need help. They need advice. They need counsel. And though the journey is far and it's long and potentially even dangerous, they will go for the sake of the saints. We do little things and we we, we want a pat on the back for our service to the saints. And here's someone who just gave freely of himself and of his household to show radical, generous, Devotion and love to the Lord's saints. Uh, with him, uh, Fortunatus and Achaicus, we know literally nothing about these people, really. At least that we get from scriptures. But we know that when they were there with the Apostle Paul, despite the difficult message that they carried, necessitating this letter which says some painful things, The apostle was nonetheless refreshed by their visit. He was encouraged by their visit. They didn't just show up to dump a lot of responsibility on Paul. But they were sure to refresh him and to encourage him. They didn't leave the apostle feeling empty and drained. But even as they sought his help, even as they sought his his external pastoral care, they also sought to be a blessing to him. They sought to minister to him, to encourage him. And and my finding is that all too often people want to show up to get help. But it's actually considered unreasonable even to be expected to give help in return. Or to bless or to encourage in some way. 
And that is uh, it's very in vogue at the moment to um, to talk about spiritual abuse and to talk about pastors who are fallen and sinful and have um, have abused uh, people in their churches. What's less popular to talk about is the other kind of spiritual abuse where you have pastors who are uh, neglected or not just pastors, servants who are neglected in the life of the church in a way where they are left feeling empty and weary. The Apostle Paul is able to send these people out saying they've refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. I'll come back to that in just a moment. There's this other couple. um, uh, Verse 19, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca. Also known as Aquila and Priscilla. They're sending um, uh, uh, greetings. Together with the church in their house, they send you hearty greetings in the Lord. Where is Paul writing from? Well, he's... We saw it just last week. He's in Ephesus. And so there in Ephesus or in that region, Aquila and Priscilla are hosting a church in their house. What is that if that is not devotion to the Lord's saints? The Lord's saints need to meet together. They need to stir one another up to love and good works. To meet together, they need a place to meet. And so they are welcomed into this home by two tent makers. And they are shown hospitality and kindness and generosity by this couple. And and this is not just a one-off. This is something that they are known for. When the Apostle Paul first went to Corinth, perhaps you remember when we began this series, those of you who were here at that time, uh, in Acts, And we saw there in the uh, book of Acts, in chapter 18, uh, the Apostle Paul, having left Athens, went to Corinth and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He lives with them. He works with them. Later on in the story, you have this man named Apollos who shows up in um, uh, who, who shows up in um, in Ephesus because Aquila and Priscilla, when Paul went a while later to Ephesus, they went with him. And a man named Apollos shows up in Ephesus, and Aquila and Priscilla disciple him. Apollos eventually ended up in Corinth. And so you see how all of this is sort of working together in some way. Well, Aquila and and Priscilla were also greeted in the letter uh, to the Romans. At the conclusion of that letter, Paul says to greet them and the church that is in their house. And so this is a couple that made a profound impact on at least three major cities of their time and um, were hosts to Christian communities in those three places, in Corinth, in Ephesus, and in Rome. What is that if it is not devotion to the Lord's saints? But uh, I I must move on from from that. There's also devotion to the Lord's servants. Some people are in the church, they are known for who they are. They are saints in Christ Jesus. There's not much else that you can say about them, perhaps. If you were to be asked, what do they do? Well, you know that they're present. You know that they're an encouragement. You know that they're a blessing. You know that to talk to them is refreshing. And you know that they are actively involved in the church. But but identifying specifically one thing that they are known for doing might be a challenge. 
there, there, there are some people known simply for who they are in Christ. Their beloved brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. But there are also people who are known for what they do. For their hospitality. For their kindness. For their generosity. For their devotion and service. People like Stephanus. People like Fortunatus and Achaicus. People like Aquila and Priscilla. Let me ask you, is it right for Stephanus, for Fortunatus and Achaicus, for Aquila and Priscilla to always be pouring out? And for the people to whom they are pouring out, never be pouring in. Are are you following me? They're giving of themselves. They're giving so much of themselves. But they're not taking in. And they'll keep giving of themselves. Whether they take in or not. Because that's who they are. But that doesn't make it right. It's not for them to ask. It's not for them to tell. It's not for them to request or say. Rather, it is for those who are God's saints to whom they have been devoted to see and to recognize these people are special. I know, you know, we don't like thinking in terms of authority. We don't like thinking in terms of structures or hierarchies or, you know, greater than or lesser than. And a lot of that is biblical, but some of it is not. Because the Bible speaks about overseers and deacons. The Bible speaks about leaders. The Bible speaks about, in this case, servants, people who are serving the saints, who are nonetheless worthy of recognition and care themselves. In the household of Stephanus, he says, um, uh, were the first converts in um, Achaia, and they've devoted themselves to the service of the saints. His point is not the household of Stephanus. His point is you, the church of Corinth. I urge you, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts. You know they've devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Verse 16 continues the thought. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. Again, there are in the family of God people who are known for who they are simply in Jesus Christ. It's not to say that they are solely consumers of God's grace and goodness in Christ and the blessings and benefits of the church, though there might be a fair amount of that going on, but that that they're known for who they are in Christ. There are others who are known for specific acts of service, for excelling in devoting themselves to the work of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, be subject to such as as those. Does someone else have another rendering of that that might shed some light on it? Submit. Submit. And so to be subject to is, as I was asked this week, um, uh, I think it was you, Adrian, asked me, what is that, what's he saying there? It's subjection. Well, people don't like thinking in terms of submission or subjection. But the key here is not Siphonus with some sort of iron rod beating people down into submission, bludgeoning them into subjection, walking all over them like a doormat. But rather it is Siphonus, if anything, making himself the doormat. Siphonus being a servant, Siphonus and his family devoting themselves to service, And Paul saying the right way to to treat people like Siphonus is to submit to them. For you, as low as they have made themselves for you, for you to make yourself lower in humility. Not just for them, but for any fellow worker, for any laborer, for anyone who's excelling in service of the Lord and His people. Be subject to these. Now, he rejoices and he talks more about Stephanus and he talks more about Fortunatus and Achaicus making up for the absence of these people that he so loves. 
with all of their flaws. They refresh my spirit as well as yours. And he says, give recognition to such people. I think this is actually, um, uh, and I say, I, I say that knowing we, we all uh, in the room today uh, come from different cultures. But there is this, so we say, vaguely defined London culture that resists giving recognition to anyone but self. Does that, does that make sense? Is that fair? That we crave recognition for ourselves, but we are wants to give it to others. And I, I don't think it's just London. I, I mean, I, I think getting out into other places, I've seen it as well, where, where people are serving, they're breaking their backs in service, and no one recognizes it and no one cares. And maybe, maybe it's a vague, again, vaguely defined British cultural thing. I don't know, because I know I go to other places. I have been to other places in London, uh, even, where um, they, 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 they may not even dot every I and uh, dot every I and what is that? Jot every T? Uh, whatever. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, they, they might get, do everything just like we do. They, there may actually be some areas where they are profoundly different. But one thing that you can't fault them for is the way they show recognition to people that they believe are are faithfully serving the Lord. I think this is something we um, uh, need to grow in, need to develop in both ourselves as a church and um, more broadly, our type church, if you will. Culturally, we need to recover showing recognition to people who are faithful servants. I've heard people sneer about um, um, uh, this thing that goes on in my my homeland. Uh, Once a year, there's something called, um, I think it's called Pastoral Pastor Appreciation Month or Pastoral Appreciation Month. Um, Okay, so we sneer at that. We say, oh, that's stupid or, oh, that's gimmicky. But let me say, it's a lot better having a, a month devoted to that than nothing at all. And sometimes that's the way it is. It's a, lot, it's a lot better showing intentionality to say we're going to set aside some time and space to genuinely, proactively recognize and respect those who have served us and those who have helped us and those who have bent over backwards to, 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 to love us and to care for us. It's better for you know, you don't like what they're doing, do something better. But don't talk down to people who, who have their own way of showing recognition. It's important. It's biblical. It's right. Paul needs to be recognized. That's why Stephanus and his crew went to meet him. Paul felt refreshed, even though not all of the news they brought was good. Um... Stephanus and his household need to be recognized. Apparently the church at Corinth wasn't doing that. So the Apostle Paul had to urge them very strongly. Recognize people like this. You have, you have you know, and it's, again, don't get me wrong. This is, not just, this is not just pastors. This is not just church leaders. There's no indication in the text that these men were that. Everyone in the church should be doing stuff. Everyone in the church should be rising in spiritual maturity to take responsibility, to have their own ministries within the church, under the oversight of the church, to to be proactive in service in the life of the church, either in leading those things or in assisting those things. Your ministry might be in the kitchen. Your ministry might be uh, cleaning. Your ministry might be um, evangelism, or um, uh, and it might be very niche types of evangelism. So you might you might be like you know I, I really have a ministry of street evangelism, or I have a ministry of door to door evangelism, or maybe you have a ministry of prayer. You feel you can't do much, but you ask people every week, you know, what can I be praying about? And maybe you have to stay at home a lot, but you 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 stay at home and you pray for the church and. In ways seen and unseen, um, you are serving. All of you must be serving. And the thing is, when you serve and when you, when, when you do that, and not just half-heartedly, not like you know, it's some sort of optional add-on to your life, 
you are worthy of recognition. You know, you're, you're worthy to be blessed. And it's like, oh, I'm not worthy of recognition. Sometimes it's those, those are the very people who are most worthy. Those who don't see themselves as such. But don't, don't, don't give yourself a pass too easily. I don't see myself as worthy of recognition. It could be that you're just being humble. It also could be that, um, <laughs> that you aren't worthy of recognition. <laughs> and it's time to step it up in your Christian life. And if you need help, you know me. We can have a chat about it. You know, my, 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 my door is always open. Not literally. It's wood green. Um, but you can always say, can I come around? I need to grow in service. I need to grow in, 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 in dedication and devotion and love. I want to excel in loving my brothers and sisters in the church. And one day, I could write a letter about you, how you've refreshed me, and how you're worthy of being given recognition. One thing that is sad, and it's the flip side of this, I see people who are gifted, who are serving, who are qualified, capable, gifted, and they're in churches, just sat there. And it's not for want of trying, and it's not for want of service, but their churches, for whatever reason, just don't see their potential. No, it's not even that they don't see their potential. They don't see who they are. They don't see what they are. They don't see what they're doing. And that's a sadness. I don't want that to ever be the case here. I want to platform you, as it were. I want to boast about you. I want to, to praise you and to say, wow, you know, just excellence in each of your lives. And God willing, we'll get there. Devotion to God's servants means seeing those people who excel in service and being subject to them and giving recognition to such people. Finally, we see not only devotion to the Lord's saints, not only devotion to the Lord's servants, we also see devotion to the Lord, our Savior Himself. I, Paul, write this, this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Well, that's an extra layer of Unloving. If you're in the church and you're not loving your brother and your sister, you could say that that causes some, some questions. There's some concern. But when you don't love the Lord, you, you, I mean, you're not right. If you don't love the Lord, you can't, you can't start loving your brothers and sisters because they're not your brothers and sisters. Anyone who does not love the Lord is accursed. Anyone who does not love the Lord, anyone who's not devoted to the Lord, anyone who does not see the Lord as, as eternal treasure in the heavens, infinitely valuable and worthy of sacrifice and service, utmost devotion, worship, praise. You know, if you don't, at least even at an, ab you might not be showing that, but if even at an abstract sense, you don't acknowledge that, you're lost. And you need, to, you need to come to Him and see Him for who He is. All that He is. All that He's done. How He's, how he's loved you. How He's loved us. How He's given His life. So that if we repent and believe in Him, we will be saved. I mean, it is um, a travesty that he even has to say this. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. If you would be de devoted to the Lord's saints and to the Lord's servants, you must be devoted to the Lord himself. And that means you long to see him. You long to be with him. You long for his appearing. You long for his glory. You long to... 
you know, it's not, you're, you're, you're not always putting a caveat on when you want to see the Lord. He says, come, Lord Jesus. It's also the closing prayer of Scripture. Our Lord, come. We, we need your salvation. We are weak. We are broken. We are needy. There are some things that are in this letter that will never be entirely as they ought to be. We're growing. We're in the language of the moment, I think, is uh, we're, we're on a journey. As we're on this, this journey, we must have the Lord. In fact, wouldn't it be nice if the Lord came out to meet us and cut our journey short? Not in a bad way, but in a saving way. But we all know no, we, 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 we're a bit like Augustine. Augustine was this um, a godly man in North Africa. He hadn't always been that way. He was a, a pastor in North Africa who, uh, for the first 30 or so years of his life, was just totally given to sin. He had a godly mother, follower of Christ. But um, he uh, indulged in, in theft just for the sake of it. He'd steal things just so he could throw them away. He uh, was sexually immoral. He would go to church just to pick up ladies. And he prayed this prayer. Lord, give me chastity, but not today. In other words, Lord, make me an upstanding man. Make me a sexually moral person. Make me an upright individual, a godly person, a holy person, a righteous person. But not today. There's someone I'm going to be seeing later. And I don't want, I, I, I don't want my, uh, my profession of faith, to, my salvation to interfere with our good time. Some of us are like that when it comes to the coming of the Lord. We're, we're, we're like, come Lord Jesus. But maybe delay it till after I'm married. <laughs> Single guys, ladies, right? Uh, let, just let, let, let me enjoy that for a bit. And then you can come. Come, come Lord Jesus. Just, just wait a little bit till after I've had kids. I really want the joy of, you know, holding my own children. I want that legacy. I want to be up there in heaven and have lots of children and stuff around and grandchildren and stuff. You know, so actually leave it to the grandchildren. Come Lord Jesus. Just let me taste a, a little more in life. There's a restaurant I've really been wanting to try and I, you know, I've heard good things about. I'm serious. That's how petty we are. Come Lord Jesus. But leave it till after July when the, you know, after I've seen the next Christopher Nolan film, you know, it's a, 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 or, or, or mm, June, July next year. I, 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 you know, me, I like Batman films and there's this Batman film, July 2021. Wait till after that. I just want to see how they t treat the story. Come Lord Jesus. And we add all of our little qualifiers, some of which seem substantial and some of which are absolutely downright stupid and silly. But here he doesn't put a qualifier because he knows how broken, how broken they are and how in need of healing they are. He sees the suffering of, 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 of the world. He's not living this, this fairly relatively comfortable and and a privileged life that perhaps we in this room actually, in ways that we might not even admit, um, have obtained or has been given to us or has been left to us. He's there in Ephesus wrestling with wild beasts. There are many adversaries. The church at Corinth is imploding. Brothers and sisters who, 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 who you know, were, were walking the straight and narrow seem to be wavering in their faith. There's division and indiscipline and sin all around. Come, Lord Jesus. And anyone who has any sense of awareness about the world 
today should be able to throw away all of your your silly reasons for why you want Jesus to delay his coming and, and, and should join the prayer of the apostle. Come, Lord Jesus, our Lord, come. Anytime you add an asterisk or a footnote to our Lord, come. You are saying there's something else more valuable of your devotion, more, more, more worthy of your devotion, something else more valuable, some other treasure that awaits you that you want to enjoy first. Love. Love that everything we do should be defined by requires that we love the Lord. And as we love the Lord, and as we pray our Lord come, we're able to know the reality of the grace of the Lord Jesus with us, as verse 23 says. And we're able to know the love of, of, of the, the, the leaders, the spiritual leaders God has placed over us, as we see in verse 24, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. And we're able to all together join in unison in the final Amen. Because it's great to love the Lord's people. It's great to love the Lord's saints. It's great to love the Lord's servants. And it's greater still to love the Lord who is our Savior. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we've concluded our our time in this letter, we pray that you would nourish us, teach us, change us, transform us. Make us more like Christ. Father, take what is an unhealthy church in ways we may not see or care to admit and make us a healthy church by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.